where he had pleaded his case to be heard by Caesar. And, uh, and last week when we studied, we saw that, that when they got to a certain island, and I didn't put the map back out here, but the island of Crete, on the bottom half of it, all they wanted to do is, it was becoming winter time. It's like the end of October here. And, uh, and they just wanted to move a little bit further because on the uh, western southern corner of Crete is a, is a better place where the winds blow or maybe the city is nicer. But it, it's a place that those that, that knew, the play, uh, knew the island of Crete, that navigate the sea, that they wanted to spend the winter there. And uh, they knew they weren't going to make it to Rome during, until, until the spring breaks. And so the, all they wanted to do is move 20 miles. And the Apostle Paul cautioned them about, <laughs> about trying to go any further. And then they re- rejected the Apostle Paul's advice. And as a result of that, they suffered the consequence of, uh, of trying to move a ship at, at the wrong season. And, uh, and so we followed their, their, their course where they've lost control of the ship and are blown by the wind. And, uh, and, and we got to a point where we saw that it's quite a bit of information, but, but it ends where, where we ended last time is where the Apostle Paul now is going to speak again to them and actually provide words of truth and hope. Because where we read all the way down to verse 20, uh, they thought all hope was lost. And then Paul's going to speak and offer them hope again. Now, we're not going to be able to cover all the verses of, that Paul speaks about truth and hope. Uh, we'll, read, we'll read them. We'll make some comments about them. But there's a couple details that I want to uh, look at again uh, next week that are a little, little bit deeper, a little bit something I, I, I prefer not to cover today. But, but anyhow, in Acts chapter 27... Um, it, look at verse 9, and then I'm going to read to you verses 14 through 20 that we've already studied. Verse 9 says, Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Now catch verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And we talked about what, what things you know, control the way that we make a decision. Um, Paul didn't say he's prophesying this, but he did perceive something, and, and so he's given like a voice of reason here. But people are involved in politics, people involved in, in uh, money-making, uh, like the owner of the ship and all, they have a little bit different agenda. <laughs> And, and sometimes, whether it's uh, like even the rest of the men who wanted to get to a different place on the island of Crete, it, it was just a place of comfort. So they wanted it just because it's a, it's a comfortable thing. And then because they thought they, that the weather turned nice, that they got their purpose, they just superstitiously said, all right, let's jump in the ship and go. And, and look what happened, verse 14. It, the point I was making there is people make decisions for all kinds of wrong reasons. Paul was giving them a voice of reason. But just like Paul warned them, verse 14 says, But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euclidon. And when the ship was caught, they could not bear up unto the wind, we, uh, and we let, her, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, struck sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out. Now Paul's a prisoner. <laughs> they got the prisoner and everybody else on there. We cast out with our own hands uh, the tackling of the ship. And by the way, I said we, but that's not Paul, that's Luke. Uh, but but it looks like everybody on ship is, is working here. And then, uh, and then verse 20 says, And when neither sun or stars in many days appeared, and no small stem- tempest laid on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. And verse 21 says, But. <laughs> so they've lost all hope. 
And, uh, and certainly the, this tempest, we said some people call it a typhoon, but <laughs> it didn't let up because now they're three days into journey. They're way past where they were trying to go. They're out, out in the Mediterranean and they're even worried about shallow places in the Mediterranean sinking the ship. When it talks about those helps, we talked about that they're actually tying ropes underneath the ship to try to hold the boards together, which means it sounds, looks like the boards, like the ship is trying to break apart. And by holding it together, they're not only holding the ship together, but they might be by holding back some of the leaks that are coming up. If the boards are coming loose, the ship is taking on water. That's why they're lightening the ship. And they're taking anything heavy, anything that can move and cause more damage, they're throwing it overboard. And they can't keep up with it, so they get everybody involved in throwing things, the tackling over the ship and lightening it. And then when they can't do anything else and the weather won't change, all hope that they should be saved is now taken away. Now watch verses 21 through 26. It says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and have not loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whom I, whom I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. So Paul does give them truth. Uh, he's the voice of truth and of hope here because they have lost all hope. But he, before he's done, he's telling them to be of good cheer. And uh, but there, there are several things in the expression here that, that I want you to see. If we could go back through verses 21 through 26, just for the obvious statements here. There's long abstinence. So they went through three days. I don't know how many days has, has gone by. The, they haven't been eating. They've just been working. Uh, but th just to stay afloat, just to stay alive. And, uh, but now there's nothing to do, long abstinence, Paul stands forth in the midst of them. Now, and when he says, sirs, you should have hear hearkened unto me, he's not, I told you so. <laughs> but the, like we said, back there where they made the choice about what they should do, they should have listened to Paul. I mean, that's what he's stating there. And he's not saying, I told you so, they should have, because he was a voice of reason. And it happened... I mean, if it's past, if, if shipping is now dangerous, what do you, why do you think you can get away with living in danger? So they made a choice based on, not on fact, they based the choice on all kinds of emotional and financial reasons. They made the wrong choice. And Paul's just making them understand here that they made a wrong choice. But now what he's about to say to them is spiritual. What he's about to say to them is a revelation that he received. And, and so they didn't hear him before, but now by saying that, maybe they'll listen to him this time, and they will. And it's amazing what they're going to listen to. But, but he says, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not to have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me. Now here, he's making the statement this time because it's based on revelation. And, and it's an amazing revelation that there's a picture here that the Apostle Paul and the revelation given to him is a revelation of salvation. Well, if we want to apply the spiritual lesson. And if he has God's message of salvation, then we better listen to him. It's one thing to listen to the voice of reason. It's another, listen, it's another thing to listen to the revelation of God through God's apostle a message of hope and a message of truth and a message of salvation and and so if they haven't listened to him he says listen now and 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 he tells them that there there be no loss of any man's life but of the ship interesting that that here the most valuable thing is life and materialism isn't that important and uh and and that's true even in the spiritual to have spiritual life is more important than all the physical things that take place in life because to have spiritual life is, a, li, is life that lives past the physical, that's eternal. And, uh, and so it's, it's more important than that. When it says 
there'll be no man that'll lose his life. Later on, and we'll look at it again so we'll be able to actually study it in more detail, but it, it, if we read past where we stop, 14 days are going to go by, still out in sea. And they're finally going to see some land, but it's nighttime and it's not time to try to make it to land. If you look over uh, uh, verse 30, it says, And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat, and by the way, we talked about the boat earlier, and, and then we talked about how when it talked about they hardly came by the boat, there, it looks like a lifeboat that they were towing behind, that they barely rescued the boat earlier. Now, when it, now, now, that's, now they got the boat and they put the boat back in the water because they're going to try to make it to shore. They see a shore out there. So anyhow, it says, uh, again, verse 30, And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, as though they were... They would have cast uh, anchors out of the fore, uh, out of the foreship. Paul said unto the, said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. And the soldiers cast off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And then they waited for day. That's amazing. They're, they're listening to Paul now, aren't they? <laughs> they they pull down the lifeboat. It's dark, but we can make it to shore. Let's not spend another night in this sea. And Paul says, unless you abide in the ship, you can't be saved. And the centurion cuts the rope. Everybody's staying. Made sure everybody stayed. Wasn't that what the prophecy is? No man's life will be lost. If they got in the ship, they would have been lost. But he made it a way that, nope, you can't get out if you wanted to get out. You see eternal security in that. And, uh, and so uh, there is... There is security by uh, salvation by listening to the Apostle Paul and, and believing the things that God said to him. For us, it's not about a ship. It's about being in Christ. And the way that you're in Christ is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That when you trust the gospel, that you're by the Spirit of God placed into Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God sealed unto the day of redemption. So the ship would be Christ, and you couldn't get out of him if you wanted to get out of him. There is, no, there is no safety outside of Christ, but you're safe in Christ and secure in Christ. So anyhow, going back to verse 22. Um, he says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall, no, there shall be no, no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whom I am and whom I serve. And certainly a reference to God there that he serves. Saying, Fear not, God, uh, fear not Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Well, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And the only way that we can be saved in a spiritual Paul's message, God will save all them that come through the gospel of the grace of God that was given to Paul to us with. So you can see in this just the grace of God in the lost people on this ship that they're going to be saved. The reason their loss is not, they're not going to suffer a loss of their life is because of Paul. He's the reason that they get to live. And, uh, and and the revelation, when you think about it in the dispensational sense, and Paul says in, in Romans chapter uh, 9 that he could wish himself a curse for Christ, for his kingdom or flesh, according to the flesh, that Paul understands that his salvation was for the means of which Gentiles could be saved. And, and he could, and, you know, it's not that he can, but he could in the sense that, that if he wasn't saved, God's program for Israel would have continued on that his salvation is for the sake of salvation of Gentiles. And, and, and even when we consider the Jews in the age of grace, sometimes when I say that, some people remind me that, well, Jews can still get saved in the age of grace too, but they get saved like a Gentile. All have sinned and come short. They're, on the, they're in the same category as a Gentile, and because of Paul, then, then there is salvation for us. 
see that kind of in the picture of what, what the Lord's saying there, that he's going to give them all. That they're going to be spared because God's going to save Paul's life. But there's two things there in verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as he told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. That verse 25, if you know, we were talking the other day on, on a Sunday here, we were talking about the difference between faith and belief. You know, sometimes the Bible, like Paul said in, in Acts uh, 16, 30, 31 there, in the book of Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it says. But then when we quote the verse, we say, for by grace he is saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, but then man should boast. Well, faith is everything that's explained in verse 25. In, in this, verse 25 says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it should be even as it was told unto me. So faith involves believing what God said. But then it also, not just believing what God said, but trusting. He's telling them to be of good cheer. They're still out in the ship. The weather didn't break. You know, why would they be of good cheer? Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Paul says, I believe God. It's going to be just like he said. And what faith will do, it'll believe God and just rest in God's faithfulness. We talked about the president of King's College, the old president, uh, Dr. Cook. Uh, when I used to hear him talk about the definition of faith, I thought, boy, he's got it. He said, faith is taking God at his word and leaving the consequences just on his faithfulness. I mean, these guys can't call him the sea, can they? God can call him the sea. He's, and, and he, he's not going to call him the sea. He's actually going to save them through the rough sea. But God can do that too. And, and and so what they have to do, they can actually be of good cheer, believe God, and just rest, trust in his faithfulness. And, and that's what faith is. It's believing God. And, and so there's that verse 25 is a, is a great verse of what faith is. And for us, believing God isn't that we're going to make it through the sea and, and the ship and make it to shore. We're not sailing the fall in that sense. But the Apostle Paul gave us a message of salvation. He's the one who the first time, the first one to preach the good news of the cross of Christ. Everybody in the book of Acts in our previous study, they would preach Christ as Israel by wicked hands, crucified and slain the, the Prince of Peace. And so it was always spoken about that they did some evil to Christ. But it's, it's what Joseph learned in the Old Testament, that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Because the good news in the cross is that Jesus Christ actually gave himself. God sent his son, and Jesus Christ gave himself to die on the cross because on the cross he paid for our sins so that there is a payment before God, that God is satisfied that that payment took care of the penalty of our sins. And now since our sins have been paid for, we're redeemed, then the salvation is a gift of God by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and what we are to do is believe God that Christ, dealt with our sins, paid for our sins, supplied our salvation, is our propitiation, which means God is satisfied that that he took care of every last sin. And when we trust the blood of Christ, when we trust what Jesus Christ did, the death, burial, and resurrection, we're declared righteous by God the Father. And, and so we just believe God that it is even as he said. And when we believe God, God, God saves us. We just trust it. And the Bible says, it says in Titus, God, in, in, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That's pretty good. <laughs> he gave you the hope of eternal life. He says, if you believe on my son, I'll save you, and you are saved, and you have eternal life. But now you have to trust him. You have to wait to die and to go to heaven, don't you? So that's what faith is. I believe God that it shall be just as he said unto me. That's why Paul said in, was it 2 Timothy? I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which he committed unto me against that day. Which, oh, keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Paul committed his faith in, in God, and God is able to do what he said. And that is to give us eternal life, absent from the body, present with the Lord now. But then comes resurrection to actually take these bodies after they've been buried in the earth for who knows how long put them back together in resurrected form, glorified form, and be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. That, that's verse 25. There's two things. In, in verse 24, 
that we'll talk a little bit more about. Verse 24 says, the, the angel said this, that, he, that no one's going to die. And he, there is going to be the loss of the ship, though. But uh, it says in verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. That, what? Is this just a curiosity? Maybe you, you want to deal with it tonight? Is that Jesus, the angel of God? Oh, that's what I want to wait to. Yeah, I got notes on that. Okay, I, I, just, I don't know if we'll nail it down, but I, yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the things I don't. I actually want to do something different yet, um, but excuse me. yeah, well, that no, that's. I mean, it just steers me in the face too. You you heard his question, right? Come back next week. We'll talk about it. Verse twenty three. <laughs> For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. You think because I'll ask you next week before I look at it. When it says angel of God, and then it says whose, does that go back to the angel of God, or does it just go back to the word God? And that will answer your question. I don't know grammatically that way. I just know how to study, and you'll you know too. So you can take your concordance, study who the angel of God is in other places, and we'll talk about it next week. But anyhow, um, what I wanted to point out to you, and it's just really in passing, in verse 24, that the angel said that Paul, now see the word must be brought before Caesar? See, they're going to be spared because what God's purpose that he's accomplishing here, God, Paul must be brought before Caesar. You know, it's amazing to think about, we're talking about the God of the Bible. And way back, I mean, when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, I mean, Moses goes into Pharaoh. Israel, Egypt was a great nation at that time. God had a message for Pharaoh. When finally Israel goes into captivity, they, be, they weren't the testimony that they should have been to the nations. There was a time when Solomon affected all the nations. But when Israel wasn't a testimony, God raises up Daniel and he starts talking directly to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, who is now the wor first world power. It's amazing. God has not left the kings out of the, out of the Bible. Those that are empowered in the world. Because here there's a dispensation of grace and Paul, God is sending his ambassador of heaven and he's going to make sure he gets all the way to the top man, the top government official in, in Rome in his day. Isn't that amazing? So we're not talking about, Christianity isn't something that was done just over in Israel and no one knew what was going on. God had a witness to Caesar and, he, and Paul must, appear before Caesar, that's God's purpose to make sure Paul, when he says you're going to appear before kings, he's already appeared before Agrippa the king, but he's going to the top. And, and it must be, God's going to make sure that gets done. So that's why he's going to be spared. Then notice verse 26, because this now is helping me understand chapter 28 a little bit better. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. So, we, Paul, you must appear before Caesar, but before you do that, You've got to go on a certain island, <laughs> and must be. It makes me look and wonder about all this. I've done it several times, but I never put one message together, maybe because there's too many of the must, must be. But, uh, but that, that'll be an interesting study sometime. Um, I, like I say, it, it, it draws my attention. I want to point out to you. Now, here's what I want to do for the rest of today's study. And what it is, is go back to verse 21. After long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. The Apostle Paul, like I say, there is an analogy here. We, we started out last week talking about Israel who failed to hear their apostle. As a result of that, there is a consequence. And the consequence, God cut off the nation of Israel but rather than bringing wrath to the world, he brought salvation. And that's what Paul, that God concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So now, Paul is God's spokesman to the world about the message of God today. And, and there is a, if you take the, the, the scenario here and, and add the spiritual sense, now Paul goes out to the Gentiles. We, we made the mention last week, we saw a verse in Acts 28. At this point in Paul's ministry, he said the Gentiles will hear it. The salvation of God to sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. So the Gentiles were willing at this point in history to hear what the Apostle Paul had to say. And, and when he said, you should have hearkened unto me, 
the, the Gentiles need to hearken unto the Apostle Paul. He's the one who's got not just the plan of salvation for today, but the God's whole purpose for us today. We live in the dispensation of grace. We're not Israel under the law, setting up a kingdom, but we live in the dispensation of grace where God's forming the body of Christ. And, it's, and if Paul is the spokesman for us Gentiles, then we ought to hear him. He's got God's message for us today. And the consequence of not listening to him is a consequence that's been outlined already in the Bible. And, and it's been warned about, but outlined in the Bible. If you'll notice, just again, if you look back up in verse 14, it says, And not long afterwards there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euclidon. And then there's all this wind, they're driven with the wind, because when they got out to sea, the wind started to drive them. As they're driven by the wind, it says, uh, um, verse 17, which when they had taken up, that is that boat, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into quicksands. They're, really about, they're worried about falling into the quicksand. So verse 18 it says, And being exceedingly tossed, they're caught by the winds and they're tossed, and then finally that angel appears, they, they think all hope is gone, but the angel appears and says there's not going to be any loss of life, but there is going to be a loss of the ship. And... Uh, and Paul says, you should have listened to me and not had this loss. So they are going to become shipwrecked. And that's the consequence of not listening to the Apostle Paul. Now follow some verses with me. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Well, wait, before you leave Acts. Acts chapter 20. Let me show it. We, we talked about it last week. Acts 20 first. I shouldn't have said back to Corinthians anyhow. It's Corinthians is ahead of it. <laughs> Acts 20, verse 28. Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders. And this is before he even got arrested and all this. But he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For this I know, for, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you day and night with tears. Night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So he, he, as he's leaving, he's going to commend them to God, and the way that you're commended to God is the word of his grace. The word of his grace is Paul's epistles. Paul writes about the grace of God. And, but he left them with a warning, even telling them with tears that I've warned you for three years, and they're, they're not, even with the warning that Paul gave and the tears, the emotion behind it, it's still going to happen. And as I'll show you in the Bible, it, it took place just like Paul said. The Gentiles got to a point, even though in Acts they're still willing to hear, they got to a point where they no longer heard Paul. When they did, our, his, our history of church history, we went into the Dark Ages. And if you've never realized that, that it's when, the, when Martin Luther, now there's other people, there's always been people that understood the message of grace, but on a bigger scale, when the world was in darkness, Martin Luther being uncomfortable that he could never satisfy God's demands to make sure that God would accept him and be pleased with him, got to reading the Bible. He actually read some people who pointed the gospel out to him, but he was reading the book of Romans. And he learned there that the, the just shall live by his faith. That a person is justified before God by faith, not by all the religious ceremonies. Now here's a Catholic priest who went through extreme measures to try to please God, and he discovered that it wasn't his works that ever pleased God, it's the work of Jesus Christ, and that a person is justified on the basis of faith. He was reading the book of Romans. It's amazing that even churches that understand the gospel haven't realized it's because he was reading Paul's epistle that light came into his soul. The gospel of light comes through the gospel of, uh, given to the Apostle Paul for us Gentiles. So he didn't recognize it was just Paul that was teaching that. If he had read the book of Acts, he might not have been able to figure that out. Uh, and and if certainly if he went to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he would have never figured it out. 
Because even the twelve apostles didn't understand that Jesus Christ was going to die and why he was going to die. After he rose, they're glad he rose, but didn't understand what he accomplished. So that's reading Paul's epistles, hearing Paul that brings light. So the Gentiles go into a time of darkness for 1,500 years. And all of a sudden Martin Luther starts realizing it and posts it and people start debating on it and more and more people coming to the light to, of understanding the gospel that was given to Paul. But for 1,500 years there was a lot of loss, a lot of harm, a lot of darkness took place. Now, Paul, Paul told them here in Acts, this is going to happen. And it happened just like he said. Now, come with me, 1 Corinthians. Let's start this order. Go to chapter 12. Now this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, and here it's on a different subject, but I want you to understand how the Corinthians, now see us Gentiles, back in Genesis, we started worshiping idols. Israel had a true and living God, they weren't even allowed to bow down to an idol because God is alive, he's not some idol somewhere. But us Gentiles, we were bowing down to him. Why would we ever bow down to an idol? Watch this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know, ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus cursed, and that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, I know everyone thinks, well, Lost people can't say Jesus is Lord. Yeah, yeah, they can. But what he's talking about, catch verse 2. Ye know that ye were Gentiles before we were saved, and Paul before the Corinthians were saved. They were Gentiles, and as a Gentile they were carried away unto these dumb idols. Well, if an idol is dumb, that means it can't talk, right? So whoever persuaded them to believe in the idol? Well, that's the next verse. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man... Men began to say, this is God. And here's what he does. They make up all these stories about what, what this idol can do and where he came from and why we should worship him. The idol never said so. The idol can't even walk across the room. He's just dumb. And how is it that all the Gentiles worshiped a dumb idol? Well, they were carried away by what people said. They didn't believe what God said. They believed what man said. And man caused them to be carried away, carried away from God. Well, I think about that because that's like the ship out there in the sea. <laughs> they thought they were in control of the boat. They're just carried away. <laughs> the winds are blowing and they're, they're carried away in the sea because they didn't hear what God had to say. And now what they need to do in this, they, they need to hear what Paul has to say. And, and then continue in what Paul has to say. I'll, I'll keep the passage in Corinthians. Come over to chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now this is actually talking about someday at the judgment seat of Christ, but, but Paul's first talking about himself as being, well, what he says in verse 10. 1 Corinthians 3.10, he says, According to the grace of God which is given to me. So there's a revelation of grace given to Paul as our apostle, and then he gives it to us. He, he says, Given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So the, the, the foundation, uh, you're going to see, well, verse 11, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of God's grace to us Gentiles is the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. But that foundation is laid, Jesus Christ accomplished it, but it's laid in the sense that Paul preached it to the Gentiles and the message of, of grace was given to him. He's the wise master builder. He's the, he's the guy that the construction site is there. The foundation is laid. Now what is God going to build? What is God going to do? Well, the guy's got a master plan. The master wrote the plan, but he gave it to the, 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 the man overseeing the general contractor, overseeing the work. Paul says, that's me. I'm the wise master builder. I have the plans for God that God wants to accomplish. So he says in verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's shall work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. There's going to be a day that we're 
going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It, the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man work shall abide he shall, that he hath builded thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So Paul lays the foundation, gives us the master plan of how to continue the building that God's building the body of Christ. So we labor with Paul with, in the message of grace, and if we build according to God's master plan, there's a reward for us. That's our service, right? Verse 15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, the fire tries it. It's made of wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to be burned away. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. No man's life is going to be lost. But there is going to be a loss, isn't there? Just like in that ship. There won't be a loss of life. Jesus Christ, the foundation, he's going to save and secure everybody until the day of redemption. But if you don't build according to Paul's plan, if you don't hear him and do what God would have us to do today, it's wood, hay, and stubble. And when God tries it with fire, it's gone. <laughs> and all the efforts, all the work you've done is burned up and does not count with God and is not rewarded. And, uh, and so as a, as a result, you suffer loss, the loss of all your service, all your work. You didn't do what God wanted to do. Why? You didn't hear Paul. He's the wise master builder. God gave him the plans. And if you build according to the plans for us in the dispensation of grace, God is going to reward that. But he's not going to reward just anything. Just because you wanted to do something, that you had some superstitious reason for doing it. If you don't hear Paul, there's no reward. So there is that loss. Uh, when, you, when you read over in, in, uh, in Galatians, well, go over to Galatians chapter 5. Now, Paul's dealing with some people here that they got saved by believing in the grace of God and then they began to think that they had to do some works in order to continue that God that got to continue in God's acceptance that you had to then be circumcised and, and other things that are under the law. And, and Paul sometimes even doubts, wonders, okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> what do you trust what did you trust to save you save you? The reason I say that is well, watch chapter five of Galatians. Verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. God saved you, delivered you from the law and from sin, and now you're under grace. Why would you go back and try to entangle yourself under the law and think that you can work the law when Israel couldn't do it, and then have God's acceptance because you're able to keep the law when they couldn't do it? So he tells them, stand in the liberty. You're liberated through the gospel. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you. Now, if you realize he's got the master plans, you understand why he said, I, Paul, say. If someone else said it, they're not God's apostle, but he is. <laughs> Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You think you're, God, you're going to be, because you circumcise your flesh, that God's going to look at you and think that now you're my people. No, there's no profit in that. Verily I say, uh, no, for I testify to every man that is circumcised, he's a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, when I read that about justified by the law, there is nobody justified by the law. So these are people trying to be justified by the law. Let me tell you, in that verse, if a person is a lost person, but he's going to try to be just before God by working the law, and it says Christ is of no effect unto you, there's no salvation to that person. Because you can't be saved that way. But he's over here in chapter 5, and it's more like, except unless there's a doubt that someone is actually trying to be saved by the law, that, that the book is actually dealing with believers who are saved by the grace of God, and now going under the law to try to continue to please God. And the life of Christ, the grace of God that's to motivate our life, is not what's going to operate in their life. Christ being in them, and He is in them if they're saved, but it'll have no effect on their life because they're, they're trusting their flesh and not the life of Christ in them for motivation and service to God. God is only, God is pleased with what Christ can do in your life. Not what you can do with your life. So he says, Christ, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, verse 4, Christ has become no effect unto you, whosoever you are, uh, 
whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. And, uh, and they were worried about falling upon the quicksand. <laughs> Let me tell you, you're going to be on the quicksand if you're going to trust your flesh. And it won't be Christ operating, it'll be your flesh. And rather, you'll fall from grace in the sense that you'll fall from letting grace operate. It won't be what operates in your life. So there's a fall that takes place there. Uh, interesting, Colossians actually warns the Gentiles about uh, continuing in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, because that's what happens. They did get moved away. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Because here, just like the Corinthians was talking about gifts, the purpose of, of gifts that were given was to finally give us a complete word of God. And, and so he gave at one point gifts, and then verse 12 says this, of Ephesians 4. It says, the reason that he gave the gifts, it's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto... Now, when it says... When it says there, till we come in unity of the faith, it didn't say come into the unity of the faith. It says come in unity of the faith. That is come into possession of a complete unified faith. Now, that doesn't mean everybody has to believe the complete unified faith. It's just that you need a complete word of God so that you know everything that God would want you to know and believe. We call that the Bible. But particularly what Paul's referring to is his complete epistles. We have the whole message of grace. Uh, when it says unity of faith, unity is one, right? Look, look back up in verse 5. Among the list of seven unities, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Unity of faith is the one faith. And the one faith is that God was giving gifts until the Bible was complete. Now, with the complete Bible, look again at verse uh, 12, or verse 13. Till we all come in unity of the faith unto the knowledge of the Son of God. And by the way, let me ask you, have you come into the knowledge of the Son of God? Is there knowledge that God didn't reveal yet about the Son? <laughs> no. The, we, know, we know Jesus Christ according to prophecy, but we even know about Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. We have the knowledge of the Son of God. What God wants to accomplish through His Son, it's all been revealed. That shows you that, that verse 13, when it says, Till we come, we've come to that possession. And what that does, when we come, when we come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, look what it produces. Unto a perfect man, that's maturity, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That the Bible can mature you to the place where there, this, you, you are conformed to the image of Christ. Now, if what he's talking about is the complete revelation of Paul's epistles, what if you don't hear Paul? What if God gave you all this information so you could be this perfect man, reach the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, but as a Gentile, you quit hearing Paul? Well, look what, a, look, look what will happen. It says in verse 14 that henceforth, now this, it shouldn't happen. It says, but henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's people out there waiting for to deceive us, and, and we don't have to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, do we? Because we have a complete scripture that we can go and we don't have to be deceived by what a man says. But if we don't hear Paul and we hear someone else other than Paul, then that verse 14, well, that's exactly what will happen. We'll be tossed to and fro and carried about just like that ship out in the sea with every wind of doctrine. Well, you can read over in chapter 6 of Ephesians how... We fight against the principalities, against spiritual wickedness, about the dark, I uh, called it the darkness, I missed it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Just like the storm is dark, if, if you don't have the light of the knowledge of God's word, you're going to be in darkness. Now come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
Paul tells Timothy to stay at Ephesus. Now remember, Ephesus is Acts 20, where he met, he met with the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, where he says, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves are going to come in and not spare the flock, and of your own selves will men arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples after themselves. So he sends Paul, uh, Timothy uh, to Ephesus, or leaves Timothy at Ephesus. Verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that, that, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy had to tell the teachers of Ephesus, don't teach any other doctrine other than the doctrine of the grace of God that Paul gave us. Because as you read down, verse 4, it says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. They were, they were getting into genealogy. They are going to study Jewish genealogy and other things. They are actually, down in verse 7, desires to be teachers of the law. Wait a minute, I thought we are under grace. You could teach law? They were teaching other than the doctrine of grace that Paul gave us. Verse 6 says, From which some having... And it, it taught, the previous verse talked about faith on faith, so they were getting away from the faith, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain janglings. They've turned away from the faith to vain janglings. You know what they're doing? They're not hearing Paul. They're hearing teachers, spiritual men, want to talk about genealogy, want to talk about the law, and talk about vain janglings. <laughs> Just... Just, it, yeah, speech that doesn't have any value, doesn't have any truth behind it, but they're listening to them. As a result of that, here they are getting away. They're not hearing Paul. Look at verse 19. It says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith and have made shipwreck. You know, Paul uses all those terms about wind and tossed and darkness and shipwreck, all the things that we see taking place in, in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 27 in that ship, just like he warned them, you should have listened to me, he, there is, there's the truth that Paul has taught in his epistles that we as Gentiles need to hear him, and if we don't hear him, we're going to get tossed even to the place that we become shipwrecked. He says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they might learn not to blaspheme. They got away from the truth, and they became shipwrecked. The last, this is second, this is first Timothy. Second Timothy, Paul says, all those in Asia be turned from me. And the Gentiles turned away, they stopped hearing Paul, and as you go into church history, we call it the Dark Ages, where people are just tossed to and fro. They don't have a message, they don't have the word. But then Paul after long abstinence, Paul stood forth and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me. And Martin Luther says, Hey, look what it says in Romans. We're justified on the basis of faith. And more and more through the years, as men have come out of the dark ages, recognized the Apostle Paul in the message for us on grace, God spared us in the age of grace. It wasn't the end of the age of grace. We have another opportunity to hear the message and to be saved in the sense of, going on to minister for him. And, and just as God is going to use Paul further yet, the, we still have opportunity in the age of grace to, to serve God and not be shipwrecked. And uh, so there's a little side message to all those things that are taking place. A, a picture. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that this is a picture, but you take those words and you say, hey, everything that was happening there in a physical sense is a warning that we should listen to Paul doctrinally and not become shipwrecked in our life and suffer loss, but to, but to have Christ living in us, working through us, and us having uh, fruit in our life that honors the Lord that's going to count to a reward in the future. So, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to make spiritual uh, implication here of Paul's travels in sea and the danger and and not just the danger, but both the uh, consequence of not listening and the consequence of listening to our apostle, your word to us in this dispensation of grace. Father, I pray that you take any passage and anything said today that has value and uh, speak to each person's heart. And we thank you for the opportunity to break your word together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.